Hello and welcome to this lecture in the course Secure Systems Engineering. In the previous lecture, we had actually looked at ASLR and we seen how ASLR is actually dependent on relocatable libraries and we also looked at two ways to achieve relocatable data. So, uh, we looked at load time relocatable and the use of uh, GOT tables to achieve load time relocation of global data. In this particular lecture, we will look at functions. Essentially, if we have functions present in the library, how do we make these functions relocatable? Functions can be made relocatable in a very similar way as how data was made relocatable. So, for example, every time there is a call to a function, we could get the actual address for that particular function from the got table with functions, we can do precisely what we have done with data. We could use a got table and store the actual addresses for the functions in this got table. Whenever there is a call to a particular function, we look up the got table, obtain the actual address for that particular function and then make a branch to that particular location. This way, we can achieve relocatable functions. That is, only at the time of loading the particular library into a process address space, only then the got entry pod for that function will be filled in. Therefore, only then will the actual addresses of the function uh, be known. However, this is not what is done in practice. In practice, having a got table just like how we have done with data is quite time consuming. The reason being that there are far more number of functions in a library than the number of global data. Furthermore, most of the functions in the library are unused. In a, in a specific library, for example, libc, out of the hundreds of functions that are present, you may at most use two or three functions. So, it does not make sense that at loading time, we try to resolve all of these hundreds of uh, functions. Therefore, what is done in practice is a scheme called lazy binding. Unless a function is actually used, only then will the address of that function be resolved. So, in other words, lazy binding essentially delays binding for a function until the function is invoked. And in order to achieve this, we use a double indirection technique by making use of an other table known as the PLT table or procedure linkage table. So, this table is used in addition with the got table which is already present. So, let us see how function calls are resolved in practice. So, let us say we have a function present in a library and uh, let us take for example, say printf and uh, what happens is that when you compile your code, so the actual call to printf is replaced with a call to a function called printf at plt. So, it would look something like this where the actual call to function func is replaced with a call to func at plt. Now, plt is a table which looks something like this. Each function present in the library has an entry in the plt. So, for example, func at plt has an entry uh, in the plt table which is this. The entry for a function in the plt comprises of these three statements. First, there is an indirect jump, then there is a prepare resolver and finally, the jump to plt0. So, let us see how this function at plt actually works. The first invocation of func works as follows. So, as we have mentioned, the compiler would replace the call to func with the call to func at plt. So, this would mean that these uh, instructions would get executed. The first function is an indirect jump based on an address in the got. So, this particular got entry corresponds to the func. Initially, just after loading, this address corresponds to uh, the second instruction in the plt, which is the prepare resolver. So, essentially what is going to happen here is when you make an indirect jump, so you, you jump to a location specified in this particular address. So, in other words, Initially, the jump is just to the next line. So, therefore, you jump to the next line, run this instruction called 
prepare resolver and then make a jump to PLT0 which calls the resolver. So what the resolver does is that it determines the actual address for this function func and fills that address in the got entry. Thus at the end of the call to resolver the entry in the got contains the actual address of func. After the call to the resolver the actual function gets invoked. Thus we see that the first invocation of the func uh, invokes func at plt which in turn uh, just makes a dummy branch to this prepares the resolver and calls the resolver. The resolver identifies the actual address for the func uh, for the func function fills that address in the got entry over here and then invokes the function. So now let us look at what happens on subsequent invocations to func. So let us say we are making the second, third, fourth or fifth invocation to func and as we know the compiler has already replaced the direct call to func to a call to func at plt. So therefore the execution is supposed to come into this plt. The first uh, instruction over here is the indirect branch based on the got entry. So now what we have done over here is that uh, due to the first execution we have changed the contents of address to point to the actual address of func. Therefore the result of this jump instruction is that it is going to take the address present in the got entry and jump to that address. Therefore the actual function would then get invoked. In this way for all subsequent invocations the resolver is not invoked but rather the jump would directly go into this particular code. Thus we see for the first invocation of jump there is considerable amounts of overhead because the resolver gets invoked which has to resolve the actual address of function and fill in the got table with that particular address. All subsequent invocations of func would just have an additional jump that is required to jump to the correct address of func. So let us take an example of uh, plt. Let us start with this particular library that we have written. So this library has uh, three functions set my lib underscore int, increment my lib underscore int and get my lib underscore int. So we compile this particular library uh, using the f minus f pick file a flag and uh, thus create this library lib my lib uh, underscore pick dot so. So when we do the object dump for this particular function say increment my lib underscore int what you see is that the call to set my lib underscore int is replaced with a call to set my lib underscore int at plt. So note that the compiler has automatically changed a call a function invocation to this to a function uh, the function invocation at plt. So let us dig a bit more deeper into the contents of set my lib underscore int. So if we do a disassembly of this we see that set my lib underscore int present at the location uh, 3bc that is going to be in the plt. So it would have uh, these three instructions. So it has an indirect jump as we said. So the indirect jump uh, is based on an address at an offset of 16 bytes in the got table. Uh, so this particular offset corresponds to the function set my lib underscore int. So then there is a push uh, to create the arguments for the resolver and then there is a jump uh, to the resolver. So note that we can also look at the contents of the got table at the time of compilation. So we can do this by using the command read elf minus x dot got dot plt lib my lib underscore pick dot so. So the output of this particular command would actually be the plt table the got dot plt table. The output of this command is the got table for this particular function. Note that the contents at an offset of 16 bytes is c203 which in little Indian notation stands for 0x3c2. So this essentially points to the next instruction in the plt table. So thus what is going to happen is that the indirect jump is going to look into the got table at an offset of 16 bytes 
and jump to the location specified at this offset which in this case is uh, 3C2. Thus in the first thus in the first invocation of set my lib underscore int we are going to jump to the next instruction over here which is push 0x8 and then we are going to execute this instruction which is the call to the resolver. So, the resolver is going to execute and it is going to change this particular address to the correct address of set my lib underscore int. Now, all subsequent invocations of set my lib underscore int would uh, come here and directly jump to the correct address of set my lib underscore int which is specified in the got.plt table. So, thus we have seen how ASLR works. So, ASLR requires modifications to be to the kernel to ensure that uh, libraries are loaded at random locations. Further on it requires relocatable libraries which are located uh, which are made relocatable either at load time or by using PIC techniques. Both data as well as functions are made relocatable this way. So, in the recent years attackers have been able to bypass ASLR as well. So, in spite of ASLR being present in the system, attackers have been able to bypass the ASLR and create exploits for vulnerabilities present in the system. And therefore, the attackers have been able to run payloads in spite of the ASLR enabled in the systems. There are various techniques uh, by which ASLR can be bypassed. Four of them are actually shown over here. One way of bypassing ASLR is if the attacker determines either by brute force or by special attacks known as timing attacks where the attacker finds out where in the entire virtual address space of the process is the library actually loaded. Now, if the attacker finds out where the uh, library is loaded, then it, the attacker could adjust the gadgets and the offsets uh, within this particular library and still be able to run the exploit. Other attacks have also been created known as the return to PLT and also another one known as overwriting the god. So, all of these attacks are quite recent. So, we will not go into details about them in this particular course. But for those of you who are interested, there are a lot of online resources about how to create such attacks. Thank you.